Wow, everybody, it's great to be with you. I am Elizabeth Alfano, and as you know, this is Awesome Vegans, and I have Jane Velez Mitchell in the house. Woo! Like our hats, digging our hats, Jane Unchained. Uh, so I have lots of things to ask Jane, so I'm thrilled that she's here. I'm gonna take my hat off as I give myself a little bit of light from our big fat lights. Uh, I have lots of things to ask Jane, but before I do, I'm gonna hand you over a snack my vegan Nellies, they're kind of like vegan candy bars. They're Ooh. super good. But uh, if you feel like you need a 3 p.m. pick-me-up, because it's our 3 p.m. time. Thanks, Nellies, for keeping me uh, off the I floor. Love it. Giving well, me a little love energy candy. booster. <laughs> Who doesn't? Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Jane Unchained News Network is additional news network for animal rights and the vegan lifestyle. And okay. last year, in 2017, we had... 16 and a half million video views on Facebook. So we are getting the word out about a nonviolent lifestyle. We are normalizing nonviolence. That's what we're doing. And so if you're pre-vegan, watch us. If you're already vegan, get more active. We only have eight years. Eight years before the entire ecosystem collapses and we have, will have wiped out all wildlife vertebrates. That means all wildlife with bones. That means no more cougars, no more tigers, no more polar bears or koala bears or giraffes or elephants. They will all be gone in eight years if we don't stop animal agriculture, which is giving planet Earth a buzz cut. So Jane has started before I even got to introduce her officially. You maybe have guessed, those of you who may or may not be vegan, you may have guessed already that she is a veteran journalist. So she started her career on CNN. You had a well, show. Well, no, I, well, I not, didn't. Well, not, not started on CNN, <laughs> sorry, but she had a show on CNN. Uh, uh, that CNN was, Headline News. Right, J that was issues with Jane Velez Mitchell. Because I have a lot of issues. Called Jane yeah, Velez yeah. Mitchell. And then you've guest hosted on Nancy Grace, and you've been on Larry King and ETV, and so a long time in the media world. And so one of the things that I wanted to talk to Jane about, in addition to how you went vegan and your story, and of course Jane Unchained, which is such a powerhouse news outlet of its own now, Jane has had her eye either from within or from without the media world. And I'd like to talk to you about where the media world has come and why they're still not on board as much as I thought they would be at this point. But I want your opinion on this. The advertisers, meat, dairy, pharmaceuticals. It's fast food companies and pharmaceuticals. I mean, when I turn on the TV to watch something because I'm interested in politics, I'm I can't even mm. eat anything while I'm watching TV because it's one gross commercial after another about some horrible body function that isn't working. You know? Yeah, uh, the drug industry. Yeah. I talking. mean, and and you know, the sad part is that virtually everything that they are making money on giving you a pill is preventable or reversible with a plant-based diet. Yes. So whether it's erectile dysfunction, or whether it's high Cardiac cholesterol, disease. yeah, or whether it's diabetes blood or pressure. yeah, high blood pressure, Cancer. high cholesterol. I mean, all of it doesn't have to happen. But see, one of the points that we try to make on Jane Unchained, by the way, you can check out our content uh, at janeunchained.com or facebook.com, facebook.com slash Jane Velez Mitchell. Um, Jane Unchained is what we are, and we have contributors all over the world going live at vegan events, animal rights events. Why? Because the media, the mainstream media, is not covering it. Now, I was in the mainstream media for 38 years. Started out as a local news reporter. That's why You're I in said LA. I, I didn't know. I didn't start out in LA. I started in out LA. in Fort Myers, Florida. And then I went to Minneapolis, Minnesota for two years. Then I went to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, worked at WCAU for a year and a half. Then I went to New York City and worked at WCBS TV for eight years. Then I came out to LA and worked at KCAL TV for 12 years. And then, and then I went to uh, Celebrity Justice, which is a syndicated TV show. And that's where I started to do animal rights stuff. On Celebrity Justice. Um, yeah, believe oh, it or not, because that yeah. was the precursor to TMZ. Mm -hmm. And I was very tired of local news. And um, I had been an anchor for 12 years at KCAL. And um, I, after a very good run, you know, management changes. And they're like, you could stay on as a consumer reporter. I said, nah, I'm not really interested. I went to KCBS for five minutes. And then my friend Harvey Levin called me. And he's now the guy who runs TMZ. Mm -hmm. But at the time, he was just starting. He's a lawyer, and he had been working. He had worked at KCBS in the past. And he said, I can't find reporters for this new show I'm doing called Celebrity Justice. I said, what about me? He said, you do it? I said, yeah. So everybody said, you're nuts. It's a tabloid show. Yeah. It's going to go under after 13 weeks. You'll never be hired again. 
So I said, you know what, life's too short. I'm going to throw my hat over the fence and just have a little fun. Uh, and I'm tired of local news. And so I did it. It lasted three years. I ended up covering the Michael Jackson trial, which was a global event. That's when I ended up on Larry King Live. I was there when Michael Jackson danced on top of the SUV. I was there for the whole trial. Mm -hmm. It was crazy. And after that trial ended, the show also ended, and I started filling in for Nancy Grace on HLN. And then I ended up getting my own show, which uh, I was here in L.A. I thought it was going to last two months, so I kept my condo. I went to New York. It turned out for seven years, and now I'm back in L.A., and what happened was, and, and when I was at HLN, I, had, I was blessed to be able to uh, cover uh, an animal segment every week. What I said was, I said, would you mind if I did a little animal segment, you know, once a week? And they said, no, we don't see any problem with that. Maybe they thought it was going to be pet adoptions or something. Well, I ended up doing hardcore animal rights stories. I showed pig gestation crates. I talked to all the leaders of all the big groups and some of the small groups. And so we were really able to get animal rights on uh, mainstream, mainstream television. TV. Yeah, uh, but you know, it was, and I'm always blessed and grateful that they allowed mm -hmm. me to do that for six years. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty extraordinary. Anyway, after the show wrapped, it was a nice run, six years, I started going to protest because as my girlfriend said, well, you're unchained. You can do whatever you want. That's why I said, oh, Jane Unchained. unchained. And then, then that's how we came up with it. But also it's a metaphor for animals, unchaining animals. So I started going to these protests and um, it was striking. No mainstream media coverage. Uh, cold in New York City. People mm -hmm. are walking by because they're cold and they're in a hurry always in New York City. And nobody's documenting it. So nobody's looking at it. Nobody's documenting it. And some of these people are going to tremendous lengths. They're doing body painting. They're making these signs. They're, you know, they're really going all out. But who's seeing it if a tree falls, right? So I go, oh, wow, this is a niche I can fill. I can use my journalistic techniques. And uh, they were nice enough to give me my social media following at the time, which was like 190,000 on Facebook. Now we're up to almost 900,000 followers on Facebook. Yeah. So we've really just grown it tremendously. And I just started with the help of my girlfriend, that snarky vegan girl. She was really, it was really her idea uh -huh. in the sense that she said, take your social media following and do something with it. And then we went to this protest and I was like, we have to report on this. Where's the media? Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I'll never forget one of my first reports that we did. It was nine degrees in New York City. Mm -hmm. We were outside the Staples Center in Brooklyn. There had to be 200 protesters protesting a Ringling Brothers uh, circus event. And we were literally shaking. It was that cold because sure. it's wet, cold. Yeah. And the people are going into the circus and we're chanting. And I even remember thinking to myself, is this worth it? Like, am I wasting my time? And I thought, no, just... Do the next indicate. Do the next right thing and stay out of the results. That's you know kind of what guides me when I don't know what to do. Do the next right thing and stay out of the results. Well, we did what the do protest. You mean by that? Do the next right thing and stay out of the results. Well, if you start thinking too much about, it's like when you hit a golf ball. If you start thinking about where the golf ball's going without just concentrating I'm on hitting it, right there, it's not going to work. Same thing right. with tennis. You just got to really hit. You know, if you're thinking about. Is it going to pay off before you do it? You're not going to do okay. it right. You just got to do it and then turn it over right. to a higher power if you believe in that or to whatever. So that's a, it's actually a 12 step saying. Mm -hmm. I didn't make it up. Mm -hmm. Do the next right thing and stay out of the result. So I just did it and we reported on it. My girlfriend was there. A lot of people who have since become really good friends where they're protesting. Cynthia King, who's a great activist out of Brooklyn, her whole family was there. She runs a dance studio, vegan. She sells vegan ballet slippers. Um, a, a Donnie Moss, who does yeah. it also, theirturn.net. He's an incredible activist in New York who has done extraordinary things. Uh, absolutely extraordinary things. He got the New York Blood Center to pay for the uh, chimps, the uh, oh. primates that they abandoned on islands Liberia with no food or water. And he was relentless. So anyway, I shot this story and I edited it and I put it up there. And, you know, I was wondering, that was like one of my first stories for Jane Unchained. I thought, okay, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to do these stories that the media is not covering. I mean, why wouldn't they cover a protest with 200 people right, there? Right. They would you cover, know, cover other protests. Yes, exactly. If it was a protest about feminism or anything else, they would be, and I'm a feminist, don't get me wrong, I'm glad that they cover those too, but why, are they, why do they not cover anything involving animal rights? So we started doing it. Well, lo and behold, 
Ringling Brothers has gone out of business, yes. as we right. all know. So I'm not saying it was because of the report I did. But what I'm saying is I threw my hat over the fence and had faith. And lo and behold, a miracle happened. And Ringling Brothers has gone into the mm-hmm. dust bin of mm-hmm. history. Thank God. God. So that's what started it. And then we just kept going. Um, and then there was a big breakthrough when Facebook started with Facebook Live. Live, yes. Because I would stay up and Donna would stay up for hours editing. Yes. And everybody who's in the business or even not in the business, anybody who's ever you know. seen iMovie or Final Cut Pro or Premiere or any of these, God's editing is extremely time consuming. And so when Facebook Live came around, I said, because I'd always been a live reporter, pretty much as a reporter, um, as an anchor, as a host, I was always pretty much live. Used to being live so, in the energy. Yeah, so I love live, and yeah. it's very immediate. So I said, uh, let's just start going live all the time. So that's what we started doing. Now, every so often, I do have some good cameras, and I shoot something to do something. Like we just did a music video I called Be Kind Already, yes. which is a, an, a vegan animal rights music video, which already gotten well over 100,000 views, and we're going to continue to do others. I've, I've already got my next song. I oh, write that's songs. Great. Yes. And... Uh, so we we just keep going live. And then I said, cut me off when I'm talking too no, much. No, no, I want to hear I, it. I'm a go, talker. Go, 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 Anyway, so then I started thinking, well, when I've worked for big news operations, they have something called news feed. Mm-hmm. And um, whether it was whatever network or outlet I've worked for, they have a news feed. In other words, they have affiliates all over the country, and they take the best stories that they think have national import, and they put them on a feed, and they send them out so that other affiliates can use them right. or the network can use sure. them. So I thought, why don't we make this a news feed? I'll get contributors from all over the world. They can go live. And we'll just have a steady stream of animal rights coverage going all day long uh, for my Facebook page. And then we also put it on the website. And the website is janeunchained.com. And once it's on the website with the with the video and imagery and some little like a mini article, then we send it out to LinkedIn and other other places. So that's what we've been doing. So now we have dozens of contributors, and uh, you can be one. I would love to be one. So I'm going right, to be doing on, that, people. So you can look for that. Well, so do you anticipate the mainstream media? warming up to this issue? Because you have so many people on social media where it really is strong. So you do, do you anticipate mainstream media catching up with that? or? Well, here's the thing. You know, like when I would go to a lot of these protests, people would say, oh, well, the report, because a lot of them do let the media know they're doing things. Mm-hmm. And they do send out news releases. And they sure. say, oh, they were going to come, but there was a breaking right. news story. Right. You know, give me a break. Yeah. There's always a breaking news story. And having been in the business, I know that's what you say when you don't want, want to show up. to show up, but you don't want to be caught red-handed mm-hmm. refusing to show up. I mean, the Animal Rights Conference that just happened here at the Sheraton Gateway mm-hmm. had hundreds and hundreds of people that, you know, the most brilliant minds in America talking about the biggest problems of our time. Climate change, yeah, Go ahead. world hunger, yeah. um, health problems. Not one reporter from the mainstream media, right. and it's it's always been that way. Veg fest, they don't show up, so um, th- they're ignoring. And and there's a lot of closet vegans in the in the local well, news media that call me up and say. I want to, they won't let me cover okay. this story. And so why is that? Is it fear? Is it, you think it's actually the advertiser stopping them? And it could be that. I'm not saying it's not, but you're getting more and more money into the You don't have business. to be a brain surgeon to look at the ads and say, wait a second, if the ad's running on my TV station or Burger King, McDonald's, Wendy's, Chick-fil-A, and this, that, and the other pharmaceuticals, if I'm going to send somebody out to cover a story that's going to say basically none of those businesses should exist right, okay, uh, but as, as they are now, I have nothing against McDonald's. If McDonald's wanted to do a vegan, vegan item, <laughs> a vegan menu, <laughs> I'd eat at McDonald's. I mean, sure. they're going to eventually go that way. Right. We, we, what we have today is not sustainable. And here's the thing. You know, I was reading, the, actually listening. I listen to books while I walk my dogs. I was listening to this book, The Best and the Brightest. It's a famous book about how the Vietnam War happened. Mm-hmm. And the first thing the guy says is, The Best and the Brightest is a sarcastic title. It, You know, in other words, oh, yeah. this is what The Best and the Brightest brought us. Could do, right. The friggin' yeah. Vietnam yeah. War. Okay? And they couldn't get out of it. Yeah, yeah. and they couldn't get out president of it. And these president. are all the ones who went yeah. to Princeton and Yale and yeah. Harvard, and they're all so smart and they're so arrogant. 
And the same thing is happening today with animal agriculture and the environment. They think they're so smart. It's staring them right, right in, the in the face. And they're missing huge business opportunities. So you're seeing more and more people come over into veganism, as you guys know, and there's a huge market there. And those who get in there first are going to do the best. Not only that, they're friggin' having heart attacks and they're going into surgery and they're committing suicide and every other damn thing. Because they feel Be so bad. Yeah, because this is such... People who eat meat are killing on a daily basis. If you kill a lot, what do they call you? A serial killer. If you kill even more than that, what do they call you? A mass murderer. You know, and it doesn't matter whether you slit the victim's throat or not. I covered crime for many years, and I still to this day am not sure exactly how I got into the crime genre. What I'm not a lawyer, but one thing I learned, and sometimes, you know, uh, they thought people would say to me, as a former prosecutor, Jane, you must know. And I'd be like, I'm not a lawyer, okay? Right, Please. Okay. But it was, but it was funny because they thought I, they for some reason they thought I was. But in any case, uh, in the law, it doesn't matter whether you slit the victim's throat or you made a phone call and said, take this guy out and do it. If you're involved in the killing of another, and it's not a justifiable killing, it's homicide, it's murder. So. For those of you who'd like to pretend while you're saying ahimsa and doing d downward dog and saying how peaceful and spiritual you are, that you're not killing if you're eating animals or consuming animal byproducts, you're lying to yourself and you're a hypocrite because you have ordered the hit. This is entirely 100% a consumer issue. 70 billion land animals, not including fish, are being not only violently raped into existence, so feminists, take note, none of these animals are making love in these factory farms. No one thinks Where that. they're castrated without anesthesia and their tails are cut off and their babies Not are ripped from their mothers. Yeah. It's a horrific, morally reprehensible, evil system. And you cannot say that you're a peaceful, spiritual person or call yourself an environmentalist if you are consuming meat or dairy. And if you do so, you are a hypocrite, okay? This is the really inconvenient truth that Al Gore doesn't want to talk about. And you're ingesting all that anger. You're ingesting all of the um, antibiotics and all of the cortisol that comes when these animals are abused and right before they're slaughtered and they're slaughtered in front of each other and they're tortured until they, from the moment they're born until they are slaughtered. If you tortured. did it to a dog, oh, you would horrific. be arrested for animal cruelty. Absolutely. That's absolutely I right. I bear witness at a slaughterhouse in downtown Los Angeles when the pigs are coming in to be slaughtered. They slaughter thousands a day there. And imagine driving across state lines hundreds of miles without food or water, water. in the extreme heat That's that we are experiencing now. And when they arrive, they are frothing at the mouth and they are clearly distressed. In fact, uh, there was one that we took a picture of where the leg is just sticking out, oh. clearly dead. I mean, and then the, the actual death process, and then on the other side you can hear the screams and the squeals. Don't you dare say you're a peaceful person if you are creating the demand for that by, by ordering it or buying it. So you have the power here, this is what I love about this, is you actually are empowered. You every day, three times a day, you have the power to make a difference. And it's such an easy thing to do. You're at the grocery store, you're about to buy milk, uh, your fingers move a little bit to the right and you buy almond milk, soy milk, cashew milk, hemp milk, pea milk. There's so many options and it requires really nothing. Same amount of money. You're going to feel better. You're not going to leave the table with that ugh, horrible feeling that's in your stomach because all this animal fat isn't being digested properly. You're going to feel better for what you've done for your kids, for the future, for the environment of the future. And you're not going to line the pockets of really filthy liars in the process. And so mentally, you're just gonna feel great, and of course, the animals. And it's not that hard, and you are empowered. You, you and your wallet, you make a difference, which I think and is so great. there's something really great about our lifestyle. You know, I'm 23 years sober, and I didn't think I could go a day without drinking. I tried for many years, I'm not gonna drink today, I'm not gonna drink today, and I drank every night. I was a lush. I, I was a lush, I'll tell you that right now. And then I hit bottom and I had this psychic shift and I realized 
It's not that I won't drink tonight. It's that I don't have to. Hmm. I don't have to. What brought that on, that shift? That, just that change of mindset. It's, it's actually a subtle change. Well, you know, they say sometimes it happens slowly and sometimes it happens quickly. And it's the same thing with veganism, which I call food sobriety. It's sometimes the process of going vegan can be very slow. Sometimes people boom, bing, and all of a sudden it hits them. Danny Rukin is one of our contributors. She was a She's huge great. meat eater who would make fun of vegans. And then she had this, she woke up, I think she saw a video mm. of probably, I forget which one, but it could be earthlings, it could be meet your meat, farm to fridge. Cowspiracy. Cowspiracy, yeah. what the hell, boom. She, yeah. she, had, she woke up and went, oh my God, this is, we don't get a pass on this. We're killing all these animals. It's killing the environment. It's in, contributing to world hunger. It's bad for us. It's a leading cause of our leading killers. And she just went vegan overnight. Now she's doing protests and speak outs yes. at the very restaurants that she used to eat at. Yes. Right, she's so great. So, How did you go vegan? Well, uh, I was brought up in a mostly pescatarian household. I say mostly pescatarian. You know, we actually thought of ourselves as kind of vegan. And uh, oh. my mom was born oh. in Puerto Rico, and she had a pig that she thought was her pet pig. Oh, okay. And she came home one day, and the pig <gasps> had been slaughtered for food, and she just collapsed in hysteria. She loved that pig, and she shunned meat from that point on. Oh. Then she came to... Uh, New York became a successful, uh, she was the last of the vaudevilles. She lived to 99 and a half. So she was born in 1916 and she lived uh, to 2014. So she's almost uh, 100, just a few short months shy of 100 years old. She met my dad who was Irish and she was a pescatarian. And so my dad became a pescatarian. I hesitate because they weren't really like, uh, I will not allow meat in the house, you know, I'm not going to let somebody come in with a hamburger, but when I was growing up, we had a country house and people would come in with hamburgers. Nobody Mm. stopped them. So Mm. it wasn't, it wasn't like today, but we were on the journey. Yeah. Okay. So I was, then I became a vegetarian as I got older and read and saw more about the horrors of animal agriculture. And then I was at KCAL Channel 9 and I was doing an interview with a guy who'd become famous because he went on Oprah Howard Lyman, he's a fourth generation cattle rancher who wrote the book Mad Cowboy. He became very ill. He made a pact with God as he was going into surgery. He said, God, if you get me out of this surgery, I'll reveal the secrets of the cattle industry and the horrors of it. And he got out of surgery. He went on Oprah and she said, that stopped me cold from eating another burger. Then the Cattlemen's Association sued her. She had to bring her show down to Texas and blah, blah, blah. He became famous. And so he was doing a book tour. And I interviewed him, and afterwards, he and his publicist came out to my mm-hmm. desk in the newsroom, which we were in Paramount Studios, and uh, they said, we hear you're a vegetarian. And I said, yes. And they said, do you eat dairy? And I kind of looked down because they had just explained how the, the calves are ripped away from the mothers at birth so we can steal their milk, and they're stuck in crates or killed outright. And, you know, just the hideous, the fact that all these cows are raped, you know, that's how they... Uh, so... I hung my head and I said, yeah. And they looked at me and they went like this, liquid meat. That was the moment I went vegan. I just went vegan. They, they confronted me. That's why when people say, oh, you know, don't confront people. Be so, be so, oh, very, so polite and gentle. I'm like, well, I was shamed into going vegan. They pointed out my hypocrisy. I was telling myself I was an animal lover and I was contributing to cruelty. So, uh, I don't necessarily think that just asking politely is always the right way. No, always, in my opinion, always be nonviolent. But did women get the right to vote by asking right. oh so very politely? Right. No. They, yeah. were, ch- they were chaining themselves to, uh, to places and getting arrested and force-fed and, you know, subjected to all sorts of horrific treatment. Did uh, slavery end by people asking so very politely? It's you know, a revolt. It has to be a revolt. And it starts from the bottom up. It's not like government officials ever say, I know, I think let's do something great for people today. No, it's the people who have to say, we want change. We want things to be better. And we won't stop until we get it. And it always comes from the bottom and it has to come loud. 
Let's go protest right now. Let's stop talking. I like that idea. I like that idea. Well, so what have you found is the best way to get people to switch over to veganism? There's no one way. I say throw all the vegan spaghetti at the wall and see what sticks. sticks. Different people respond to different things. If I had to pick one thing, I'd say, you know, strap them to a chair and show them Earthlings. Because Earthlings, a movie by Sean Munson, has turned more people vegan than anything I've personally witnessed. Um, I would also say there's a new movie out called Dominion, which yes. is very, very difficult. But if you watch it and you still eat meat after that, you're so sociopath. God help you. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. And yeah. Uh, I just, I, I think that, you know, we have to confront people with the reality. You know, I have mostly vegan friends, but I have some friends that are not vegan and they just don't want to hear it. They don't want to talk about it. And they almost try to make it like you have a psychological problem right, because you. you're yeah. trying to bring it up. And one even told me, I, I went to a pig vigil and uh, uh, I ran into her walk. I was walking my dog and I ran into her and she said, uh, you know, how you doing? I said, well, I went to this pig vigil. I said, you should come. And she said, look, I know you've been very traumatized by this. Like, I'm like, like I'm somehow, yeah. you know, you it's my fault. Help. I need yes. help. Right, yeah. Because I've witnessed the truth. Yeah. And I said, no, I think I'm fine. I said, I just think it's something you need to see. And she's like, I, I can't, you know, I, I, whatever, excuses, excuses. I said, you know what? If you're eating the animals and you are not killing them yourselves. You're hiring some poor bleep who doesn't have a choice into what job he's gonna have or she's gonna have, who's at the lowest end of the totem pole in the socioeconomic ladder, and you're saying to these people, you You kill, you do it every day, you get the PTSD, you get the depression, you get the alcoholism alcoholism and the drug addiction and the domestic violence, you take that all because I want to call myself peaceful, and I want to call myself spiritual, and I want to do yoga and and throw the word ahimsa around and pretend that I'm such a good, wonderful person. And don't call yourself an animal lover, for God's sakes, if you're eating them. You know, give me a break. And Jane brings up another great point is that it's obviously horrible for the animals. It's horrific for the animals. It's also horrific for the workers who work there because those people don't care about them either. And then lots of states, there are ag gag laws. So there are reasons that we want truth in our food system for the animals, for the people who work there, for ourselves. Don't we have a right to know what's in our Uh, what we eat. I mean, a lot of people say, well, you know, oh, what's in that vegan food? Do you know what's in your steak? Do you have any idea? That food is processed and it has been tampered with, with the growth hormones and antibiotics and, you know, what they feed them. And so- Most antibiotics are fed to farm animals. Absolutely. Right there. That should tell you they're not being kept in great conditions. Conditions. Now there's a couple of things. People go, oh, well, I'm very careful about the meat I eat. I only eat humane meat. Well, you know what? That's the biggest. I'm going to come over and slit your throat humanely. Okay? (laughs) Would you like that? Yeah. So it's BS. You know, I love that Emma Gonzalez after that shooting when she gave that speech. She said, "We call BS. I call BS on humane meat. Because okay, there's no humane meat. It's all B." S. There is no humanity. And the undercover investigations have shown that the conditions are just as horrible, Mm -hmm. as horrific. Mm -hmm. Animals just in these abominable conditions that make you mm, want to gag in so-called humane farms as they are in any other farm. It's a marketing ploy. Don't be stupid and fall for it. It's a marketing ploy. Think for yourselves. When you are strongly defending your need to eat meat, you you really should consider the possibility that you're just brainwashed. And when you're brainwashed, you don't don't know know you're brainwashed. Right. You don't know you're brainwashed. You think you're defending your right to eat meat because it's your right. Just because you have the might doesn't make it a right. Okay? I, I might have the might to kill you, but I don't have the right morally. And even if I had the legal right to kill you, if, <coughs> excuse me, you were considered property under some perverse system, it still doesn't give me the moral right. So our basic premise is that animals are entitled to their lives. Yes. They are not property. They are not here to, be to become your shoes or your belt or your keychain or your meal or your jacket. Just or- like your dog isn't. Just like your dog isn't. So I have a question for you, Jane, as you're taking a well-deserved sip of water. Uh, Do you think most people know this? I mean, I I sort of wrestle with, I really think that most people, given, if they knew the facts, 
they wouldn't put their dollars behind factory farms. And yet they all kind of know you're killing them and how it's going. Some of them feel like, oh, there's a humane way to kill. They're hiding behind that. What is your feeling on this? Do most well, people I really know and just lie I to themselves? Think, I think or if do they we not look at the population, you have to break it down. There are a lot of people who are just unconscious. They're eating stuff and whatever. Yes, They're not thinking right. about it. Then there are people who know and they just... Pretend not to know. They pretend not to know. They're stuffing it down. It's like that... Did you ever see the Book of Mormon, that great... Oh, yeah. 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 And so there's that song, turn it off, push it down, yes. tap it down, yeah. push it down. It's about uh, the homosexuality. I'm gay, by the way, but it's a great song. It was basically... Don't, don't think about it. Turn right. it down. Turn it off. Don't shut it down. It. Yes. Don't address right. it. So there's Close a lot eyes. of people doing that. And then there I are people who, true. you know, I mean, there's a lot of people who can't say that they have an excuse anymore. And why they're clinging to it, um, I think that they are telling themselves stories in their heads. One of them is, well, we're carnivores. It's natural. Now, let me tell you we're something. We're omnivores, actually. If you were a carnivore... You would do what carnivores do. What do carnivores do? When they see roadkill on the side of the road, they salivate and they try to eat it. So if you were a carnivore, when you were driving down the street, you would get you some would salivate <laughs> and you would salivate and you'd pull over and try to get eat some. that roadkill. It, it has been shown by plant-based athletes, and I think to me they're really the best example of this because they're out winning, you know, silver medals. Mm -hmm. Plant-based athletes show that not only do they get enough protein on a completely plant-based, i.e., vegan diet, but they are stronger for it. You have, you know, Nimai <coughs> Delgado, who's a huge weightlifter, and you know, you have people winning medals. Patrick Baboumian, who is a strongman in the world, leading strongman in the world, and he's lifting up to two thousand pounds sometimes. So at one point he pulled a fire truck, which is even more than two thousand pounds obviously so you know he but he can actually lift with his body and walk with it so you see these incredible athletes and they're all on a plant-based diet so the the <clears throat> logic that you might need more protein or that you have to eat meat um i i feel i feel pity perhaps is not the right word but i feel compassion for those who've been sold a bill of goods about eating meat because the truth is Eating meat is animal fat. Animal fat doesn't digest in your system. Your arteries get clogged and you have heart disease. You have erectile dysfunction. And then your life no, is basically... No, I don't. Because you don't eat meat. No, because I don't and, have a penis. Okay, well, you don't. We're not joking to you, Jane. Uh, so then... <laughs> and by the way... So then your life is Because I just, just coughed. I went... Uh, doesn't mean it's because I'm vegan. No, you know, when I go to the doctor, no way you know, <laughs> these doctors who are just as brainwashed as anybody else, right? You go to the doctor and you say, whatever, I, oh, my elbow hurts. Well, are, so you're a vegan, I understand. You know, so that's and interesting. I said, what about the hundred people who are, that look like death warmed over, who are strapped to gurneys outside there who aren't vegan? I said, are, are, do you ask them, them do you ask them, well, is it because you're a meat eater? I mean, it's there. This is what you call speech carnism. There's two things: speciesism, speciesism, which is prejudice against animals. Calling somebody just last night, I had to correct somebody. I was having dinner with a friend. He said that guy's a pig, and I said, no. "Why are you calling him a pig? We love pigs. We love pigs. Pigs are great." And, and smart. he looked at me and went like, "Oh, right. oh, yeah." Oh. So we demonize these animals to also make us feel better about killing them and abusing them, um, and. Uh, we also um, engage in their speciesism and this carnism. And carnism is prejudice uh, against not eating animals. In other words, it's the oppressive society saying, you know, you should eat animals. Why? Because there are people getting really rich off of it. And yeah. guess what? Their kids aren't eating those fast food no, burgers. They God, have no, private they chefs. Yes, right. They have private yeah. chefs who feed their kids really healthy stuff. You know, this woman walked up to me once and she said, I'm looking for the nearest McDonald's. Do you know where it is? And she's, she's got a kid with her. I said, I'm not telling you. <laughs> I'm not telling you so where Jane. it is. That is so Jane. I'm like, why would you possibly want to take your kid, kid to too. McDonald's? Now, McDonald's, you're invited on any time. I would love, love to, to talk to you, you and find out why you don't have a vegan burger in the United States. Get with the program. You're going to make so much money off that vegan burger. Get ahead of the curve. Like, why are you asleep at the wheel? Get that vegan burger on. And more people will go.
more people will get go. That like, burger burger on. On. Get, get that, that vegan, vegan burger on. on. Get that vegan burger on. Get that vegan burger on the grill. grill. I like it. I like <laughs> okay, it. Okay, so we it's got my a song, song coming up. Okay. It'll happen here in my studio. Now things are changing. Applebee's supposedly Absolutely has right. just gotten a vegan burger. TGIF yeah. Fridays has a vegan yeah. burger. The counter has a vegan burger. Uh, Costco has a vegan Two. acai bowl and an Al Pastor vegan salad, which yeah. I've tried. Super good. Super good. Super good. We got it. We've got to give high points to these corporations that are changing and doing, you know, making smart, compassionate decisions, and um, you know, hold the others accountable. And don't make no mistake about it. You are voting with your wallet when you spend your dollars. And those companies follow your dollars. That's what they care about. They care about your dollars. So if you're buying silk soy milk instead of regular milk, then there's going to be more money put into soy milk and, and plant milk and almond milk. So follow your dollars. Well, I was driving here. I was listening to Bloomberg Radio. Yeah. And there was this cheese company going on and on about how they'd created some sort of like cheese amusement park where people could come in Lord. and pretend to be milking fake cows. Oh, my God. And I was just like... Horrified. Ugh. It was so horrifying. But I do feel it's because they're on the defensive right now. Um, dairy is, is down like 30%. Yeah, it's really it's really down. If you want to watch one thing, five minutes will change your life. Mm -hmm. Watch Dairy is Scary on YouTube. Erin Janice. Um, she does she's, a great She's video. a really adorable young woman YouTube. who's smart and she's got a great take. It's not graphic, but she, she explains the whole thing. The rape racks... The, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just everything about dairy, it, it's, it's so gross. Mm -hmm. And she does it in five minutes and it will mm -hmm. cure you. Mm -hmm. We are not designed to drink the mother's milk, the breast milk of another species. Just think about what she just said. Doesn't that sound disgusting? Not to mention that so many people clear up their skin when they get rid of dairy. So that's one of the reasons why dairy is down because so many people are sick from dairy. And the, you know, prepubescence that it causes in small children, basically, at this It's, point. you know, one of the most undiagnosed allergies. People who have right. had acne, people yes. who have had right. dandruff, yeah. people who have all these things, when they give Coming up dairy, dairy, they go away. Why? Right. Because we're not meant to be drinking a substance that's filled with pus that fattens right. a baby calf up right. to a many hundreds of pounds very rapidly. Right. And also, you know, a lot of things like the growth hormones are supposed to pass through the animals before they're slaughtered, but... Added I, to the list of lies. Yeah. USDA, give me <laughs> a break. Please, I mean, right. they're basically the meat and dairy industry. I yes. was just in Costa Rica and I was at, looking at the airport and the USDA is advertising meat, uh, pork. They're, <laughs> they're doing a thing about pigs and they're chopping up the pigs and showing it's like a whole little video. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Here in Costa Rica... Mm -hmm. You know, we're, it's an environmentally eco-friendly place. Wonderful and, place. And USDA is is pimping for They're trying pork. To, that's because we are buying less and less meat here in the United States. They're trying to find new markets for it. Because so those, she's right when she says that those industries are on the run because their business is down and they're on the defense. Now, if they were smart strategists, they'd just get in the vegan game because that's where the money is. And that's where the money's going. And the reason it's going there is that because veganism is the only thing that answers the problem of your health, your wallet, your planet. Oh, and by the way, your kids' planets and the animals, of course. Mm -hmm. So the life of our planet is at stake and we hold the keys. We decide three times a day where we spend our money, what we eat, and we can have a future or and not. And it tastes good. And it's, oh, you feel better. Oh, please, you feel better. And I want to say one more thing about dairy. To all my mamacitas out there, so I know you're busy and you are trying to feed two, three kids at a time, plus you're probably... Who are mamacitas? Mamas out there. Two oh, okay. mothers. So you probably are holding down two jobs. I mean, like most Americans, maybe there's low unemployment, but you are working hard for those jobs. And sometimes you have two jobs. So you probably think like, oh my God, I just can't reinvent the dinner dinner scenario every day at my house because I am busy and I'm stretched too thin. I hear you, but I'll just say this. If you do the tiniest bit of, you know, extra 30 seconds in the grocery store to find the vegan option. Potato! <laughs> French fries. Okay. Okay, no. You just take a potato and just boil it. If you, you know, people say, well, that's for elites. Eating vegetables is for elites. Excuse me. Oh my. You can take an entire cabbage and live off for it, live it, live off of it for a month. A big cabbage.
cabbage and well, you slice it up, you can make soups, you can well, make salads. Okay, so I would just say that if you think that that's true, that eating vegetables is for the elite, I would take to the streets right now if I were you and I would stand Let's up go. for your rights because eating vegetables is the only way that you're going to be healthy. And so if you feel that you're not getting that opportunity to be healthy in your own country, take to the streets because you are being screwed over. I mean, you want to have vegetables in your diet or you are going to be very sick and so are your children. Yeah, and you know, people say, oh, well, and there are food deserts. There are places sure. that have no grocery stores and no farmer's markets. And we need to change that. Yeah, and course. guess who's at fault? The U.S. government is subsidizing, you know, big ag. They're not giving subsidies. They're giving paltry, teensy, tiny amount of subsidies to, like, organic fruits and vegetables. But, oh, my God, the, the, the people who make, you know, soy. Now, some people say, ooh, soy. First of all, soy is very healthy for you. It's been test marketed on the uh, Asian world for centuries. They have lower heart disease, cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Obvious. But the meat and dairy industry was worried when people started eating tofu and drinking soy milk, they went out of their way to try to demonize soy. What they failed to tell you is soy is where in the- 80% <laughs> of all soy goes. To animal feed. So you're getting that soy anyway because that's what they feed. It's compressed the, soy. It's compressed soy. That's what they feed the animals. Oh, but before they do that, they have to raise the land and then plant that soy. So now we've taken away lots of land. Oh, and they've had to water that land. So you're losing land resources. You're losing water resources. And then all of the emissions gases that are come out of the factory farms. So you've got all this waste and plus the chemicals. It just goes on and on and on. Everything would be solved if we didn't have factory farms. We're talking about climate change. We're talking about our own health. We're talking about the future of the planet. Uh, oh, and by the way, the animals that we care so much about, that nobody wants to fund cruelty. My I do know that that's back. true. I'm so oh, excited. Jane's My here. phone Jane's woke here. up and started working again, Jane's so here. I'm going to share okay. this. So uh, you, while you go ahead and share that, I have some off the top of your head questions for you. These are some extra questions that I like to ask everybody. You're going to know these right off the top of your head. Some are one word answers and some are going to take a little bit longer. So here we go. What's your favorite snack? My favorite snack is Nelly's <laughs> there you go. N- nougat. Mwah. Okay, favorite go-to meal. You can always make it on the fly. It's okay, always good. Okay, let me tell you. I'll answer. So I have the boiling wa- the the hot water the veggie bouillon cube, Yum. some Bragg's aminos, nutritional yeast, yes. maybe throw in some spices. Then I put in the ramen. Mm. Okay, a little, like, you could either do, like, top ramen, you know, they have a vegan variety there. Yeah. Um, or get some health food, healthy, you know, the ramen that's a dark colored thing. And I put that, and um, then I take it out, and I have a soup. But what I do is I also take out rice cakes, and I take oh. the ramen and the tofu out, and I put it on the rice cake, and then I put a little soy butter on top, and then I put some vegan Parmesan cheese on top. And it's that like, it's delicious. so good. That sounds delicious. And it's also like a Jane Unchained original. I've it never is. heard of that before. Yeah, this is, it, 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 it's really kind of like my secret special, <laughs> special dish that I love <laughs> so much. <laughs> okay, what item are we always going to find in your fridge? Uh, what item are we, can you do like dun, 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 oh, well, soy milk or almond milk, excuse me, almond almond milk. milk. Okay, awesome. Do you have pets? And if so, do you think they're any different than farm animals? We probably know the answer to this, but go right ahead. I have four companion animals. I don't call them pets. I just say that they're my companions who live with me and I'm their guardian. I have Cabo San Lucas, who is a Chihuahua Terrier mix who was left in a box outside a shelter in South LA. Mm -hmm. I have Foxy Lady, who's my Chihuahua, um, (laughs) no, Mini Pin mix, and she was found dodging traffic in Fresno. And she is a princess. Mm, I mean, she puts the Kardashians to shame. She is just like, whatever. I'm going to a party. <laughs> then I I've have things to do. I have things to do. I have little Rico, who is he's from so Puerto cute. Rico, yeah. and he's our mascot, really. Yeah. I use him all the he time. Is, I yes. hold, hold him up him the- because he's the calm one. He'll just like, yeah, no, whatever. He's, he's a dude. He's, he's just, kind of yeah. like, yeah. whatevs. If you must. And yeah. um, then I we have Tux. The Tux, cats. the cat who was found in the gutter in Queens mm. by the woman who was helping my mother before she passed away. And Tux is like rules the whole house. I love it. Tux is um, very, you know, when you give these animals the chance, because we treat them like they're just human beings. We don't, you know, they walk me around the neighborhood. Yes. Oh and Tux God. has developed a personality. She likes 
to be paid attention to. And if you don't pay attention, she'll knock things off the shelves. Oh, gosh. She can take an entire oh, yeah. large bottle of Perrier and, and knock, knock it off. <laughs> like just boom, <laughs> smash. So um, she kind of, we so kind of You better watch it, Jane. You I'm better telling you, she'll be like, she'd take yeah. this like microphone and just, just knock it right it. off. Yeah. And she's not that big, but she's really quite... But she has an intention. She has an attitude. Yes, right. A major attitude. What bit of change would you like to be known for in the world? Uh, having the world go vegan. Okay. Do you think that's something we'll see in... What's your, your predictions for the future? Do well, you think we'll see that in our know, lifetime? We everybody's looking for that magic formula. Mm. How are we going to make that change? And I think that there's no one magic potion. I think it's incrementally everybody doing what they're good at. You doing what you're good at here, doing interviews. I'm doing journalism. Other people are doing journalism. I see Klaus Mitchell's watching. He's an incredible hey, hey, journalist hey. with plant, plant-based news, plant-based news in, so out of awesome. London doing yeah. incredible work. Yeah. And everybody does what they're they do. good at. So mm-hmm. if you're good at music, you can write an animal rights song. We have a vegan accountant that works with us. Love when it. we became a nonprofit recently, that. which is Jane and Chain News Network, uh, we, we needed to have a bookkeeper and we That's found fantastic. a vegan bookkeeper. That's awesome. Um, so I think that everybody needs to come together, but we need to step it up because mm-hmm. we're hitting a very negative tipping point. You know, the question for me is not, are we going to go plant-based? It's, are we going to go plant-based before we kill everything? everything? Because in eight years, if all wildlife vertebrates are destroyed, we're going to cross a threshold that we can't come back from. Like right now, we're at a point where... If we, we pivot. if we pivot, if we start rewilding some of the farmland, if we start switching to plant-based foods, mm-hmm. uh, we could we could we could bring it back. Mm-hmm. Because one of the things I learned going to Costa Rica is that farmland will regenerate uh, very quickly into right. forest within yeah. a few years. So we could start that. The qu- the big question is. What are we going to do for those ranchers and those the dairy producers can, just can transition? To they can transition to plant based. Uh, they've got the vats. They just need to They're switch ready. out how they make the milk and put them in the vats. But the ranchers, we need to provide other sources of income for them while they rewild a good percentage of their mm-hmm. land. So we're thinking solar panels, for oh, example, in Texas, they could idea. do they could use partial portions of their land for solar panels. Mm -hmm. Um, We can, there's a lot of things and we're, we're going to have a conference uh, coming up where we're going to discuss some of these things. So it's really important that we all start thinking about, it's not us versus them. You know, uh, these ranchers are are good people and they just need to find another way to make money. So I would agree with what she's saying here. And I would just add that whatever you're good at, just go and use that skill towards making the planet a better place. And lots of ways you can do that starting right on your plate, but also there's forms of activism, or if you're not an activist, you know, there's mm-hmm. only one Jane Velez Mitchell, let's oh, face please. it, people. So There's only you know, one Elizabeth that's Alfano. Very sweet. So if you're not an activist or you're not taken to the streets, there's other way. I love that story of a vegan accountant. Yeah. And so that person has taken their skill set and they're putting that towards making the world a better place mm-hmm. in their zone. That's what they do. If everyone did that, we'd see some real But change. I'd also like to see, and I'm inviting you to go to vigils. Now, I work with Anita Krines, who is the founder of the SAVE movement. She's a student of Tolstoy. She was walking her dog in Toronto. They came upon a truck filled with pigs bound for slaughter. She made eye contact with one of the pigs. And because she's a student of Tolstoy, Tolstoy said, if you see suffering, you have a moral obligation not to turn away and ignore it, but to bear witness and to go closer and to see if you can help. Because she was a student of Tolstoy, she saw this pig, made eye contact with the pig, and said, I make a promise to you that I'm going to have a couple of vigils every week of these trucks, because that pig was going to die, but she was going to bear witness. So she started the SAVE movement that has taken off. Incredible. And her mission, her goal, her intention is to have a vigil outside every slaughterhouse in the world. Mm -hmm. One thing you can do is to go to these vigils. Mm -hmm. Now, you've said that it's too painful for you, but... I'll tell you something, power through it, come with us to Los Angeles Animal Save or Animal uh, Alliance Network Vigils. They're Monday nights, they're Wednesday nights, I believe. Sunday night too, right? Well, they, you can go to Los Angeles Animal Save or you can okay. go to the Save Movement and figure out how to start your own save in your area. Uh, they're popping up all over the world. We have them from, uh, Jane Unchained has contributors who are 
uh, going live at uh, animal saves and vigils in Buenos Aires, in yeah. Switzerland, in Texas, in North Carolina, in Portland, in you know all over, and you, Los Angeles. You can really find one in every city. So if you go to Animal Save, you will find one in your near you. Yes, the Save yeah. Movement. They're and, in Illinois. They're in Chicago. Yeah, they're sure. all over. That, and, so. and if you don't have one, you can start one. And now you might say to yourself, "This is too difficult." It is difficult, mm-hmm. but boy, it will turn you into an activist. When I leave mm-hmm. those vigils, mm-hmm. I am, I'm embarrassed to be a human being, what they do to those animals. And, and when people say that they don't want to look at that, mm-hmm. don't make me look at that, I'm like, but you're the reason, reason it's, it's happening. happening. That is the most important thing we can say today on this show. You're the reason it's happening. Shift where you spend your dollars and it won't happen anymore. If the business model goes away, that suffering goes away. By the way, extra benefit for you, you reap the benefits of a better planet and better health. We are empowered. We have the power. It's like ruby slippers. We have the power. Now, we always have. We have the power. I want to end with one thing. It's good news. Uh, from the scientists I've talked to, only 18% of our diet is animal products. I thought it was much more. No. Actually, believe it or not. On an average? On an average. Because I know that there are some people so who So we beat can that. reduce that 18%. Come on now. And if, you know, if you're a person who can't do, well, I can't go vegan right now, you can reduce. You can reduce. You can make different choices mm-hmm. throughout the course of the day. You know, we, we did a whole story on how meat... Bacon and eggs was a marketing scheme that was created by somebody who was hired by a meatpacking company. Surprise, surprise. And, no. and they, they got a whole bunch of doctors to sign up. This was in the 1920s. It's all on the internet. It was a marketing scheme, and they got doctors. They said, hey, doctors, would it be good to start out with a strong breakfast after you haven't eaten for eight hours? And the doctor said, well, yeah, I guess so, sure. Well, would you be willing to sign this to say bacon and eggs? How about bacon and eggs? And these doctors just signed it all. It used to be prior to that 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 Americans ate oatmeal. They Mm -hmm. ate uh, cream of wheat. They had toast. They had orange juice. They weren't eating bacon and eggs. It was because of a marketer for a bacon company. And there's no surprise in that. And let me just ask, is that the same doctor who said she'll go right ahead and smoke because that's good for you too? So one, I have to ask on one last question because yeah. we do have to go. Jane's got, Jane's got to be places, people. <laughs> but we do have one last question and I want to add to this. So what do you wish you knew 10 years ago that you know now? And I will just say my own piece here. I wish I knew 10 years ago that I have the power. I somehow, it took me a long time to go vegan. I just didn't think it was possible. I didn't think me, one little person, was going to change the meat world. And so I I never ordered meat, but I didn't really make a conscious effort to sort of stand on the side of veganism. So I wish I knew 10 years ago that only I can advocate for myself. Can't believe the government or the USDA. Only I can advocate for myself. I wish I had stopped apologizing for Um, being vegan a lot lot sooner than I did. What made me change was listening to a a speech and a talk by Dr. Melanie Joy, Mm, who basically said, we have morality on our side. We have Mm. kindness on our side. We have compassion on our side. We're dealing with an oppressive culture where people are conditioned to kill animals blindly and unconsciously. And we have a moral obligation not to apologize, but to stand up and stand our ground. And whoever frames the debate wins the debate. So, you know, there was a time where I would be kind of like, oh, you know, going to somebody's uh, party where they were having a barbecue and saying, would it be possible to have a little bit of this this, uh, grill to make something that doesn't involve dead animals? And, you know, feeling like maybe I was imposing and now I won't go to those barbecues. You know, somebody said to me, what were you doing that was so important that you couldn't come to a barbecue of a bunch of old friends and we were having a barbecue and a get together? I'm not gonna go watch people uh, sit around and kill, basically kill animals and, and They're take their them carcasses, yeah. take their carcasses and, and grill them up and the smell, the smell of death and, and be ha ha ha, where I'm gonna see my old friends. Hell to the no. 
<laughs> I will end this interview by just saying not only thank you to Jane, but the thing that actually made me go vegan, the final straw, were all the people making fun of vegans. Because I thought, I don't want to live in a world where people are making fun of kindness, where kindness is a joke, where they think that torture is the norm and you should make fun of people who say torture is bad and that they were going to ridicule those people. And I was like, well, then you know what? Go right ahead and ridicule me because torture is torture and you ain't going to see me spending my dollars on that. I'm going to end my interview with Jane Velez Mitchell. Baby, thank you for Woo! being in my house. JaneOnChain.com. And of course, you're on Awesome Vegans. Go right ahead and subscribe. We're on iTunes. We're on WGNRadio.com. JaneOnChain.com. Thanks, Jane. Thank you, Elizabeth. My pleasure. You Thanks. rock. Awesome, girl. Woo! Thanks for being here, everybody. Bye, folks. And don't forget to be vegan.